How's everybody doing? Hey, we are really glad that you're here with us. By the way, uh, didn't Pastor George do a great job last week uh, filling in for me? I'm grateful to him for that. We, uh, my family and I, we were on our annual vacation to Naples. That's been a uh, family tradition for us. We do kind of this end of summer trip to Naples. And one of the things that I try to do for my family is every time we go to Naples, because we've been going there for years, is I try to find something new that we haven't done. And so this year, I heard about these Segway tours that they do. And that is you basically, you know, you and your family, you get on a Segway and then there's a tour guide who takes you around the entire city of Naples, or the old city of Naples, and gives you kind of a history lesson on the city. And that just sounded like a ton of fun. And so uh, I mentioned it to the kids, and they're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And so, you know, giving me like, like a lot of good teenage feedback. And uh, so I just, uh, si- so I signed us up. And uh, the, thing, the first thing they do once you sign up is they'll se- they send you an email uh, with, you got, before you can do anything, you got to sign the waivers. And this wa- these waivers should have concerned me. But, you know, nobody reads these things. It's like, you know, uh, no matter what happens to you, <laughs> we, we are not at fault. So uh, in any way, possibly, whatever. It, yeah, that's good. That sounds about fair. And so let me just sign that. And then, then after I signed that, they sent me another video. They're like, you cannot... Uh, participate until you watch this video. So it's about a 25-minute video uh, about everything that could possibly go wrong on a segue. Now, if I can ask this question, you know what it was like? If I can ask this question, how many of you have maybe, uh, and if you're, if you're willing, right, maybe you've gone to driving school because you got a ticket or something, anybody ever? Wow, a lot of good drivers are a bunch of liars. I don't know, I can't <laughs> tell. And so anyway, So they have, driving school is either a four, eight, or 12 hour course, by the way. I know that because I've taken all three. And uh, I've gone to driving school so many times, I had the same teacher twice. So anyway, but that's a story for another time. But, but that's like, if you've ever been to driving school, then you know they have you watch like these horror movies, you know, the blood flows red on the highway. And it's this, this whole idea to kind of scare you into being a safe driver. Basically, this is what it was like. Every person that I watched on the video with the Segway died (laughs) or was severely maimed by the end of their segment. Hey, don't turn this way because that guy died. Don't turn this way. They got a concussion. Anyway, it it was horrible. And I'm watching this. It was terrifying. And I'm I'm watching it. I said, there is at least a 25% chance that somebody's going to the hospital uh, after this. And I, I, but I prepaid. So we're going. And, uh, and I'm like, well, worst case, the kids will get to ride in an ambulance. That'll be a new experience. And so, so we get there and they give us the whole, sa- there's a guy there and he's given us the whole safety speech. And he's like, now you guys know from the video that you watched. And my wife says, hold on, there was a video. Yeah, yeah, we saw the video. Just keep going. And, uh, and so she's like, there was a video. And I'm like, yes. And she says, why didn't you show it to me? I said, because if I showed you the video, you would have made me cancel this little endeavor. And I, and we prepaid. So we're going. And so anyway, so they give all of us, they give all of us, uh, a helmet after the safety thing. And I got to be honest, and this, this is a little weird, but, um, they gave me the helmet and mine was uh, like kind of moist. And, uh, and, and, and I'm like, dude, what's, why is this like, I, I feel moisture. And he's like, oh no, that's because we sanitized it. And I was like, oh, okay, that's, that sounds about right. Uh, so I don't really think anything of it. Then we go outside and uh, it's my family of five, another family of five, and then these two friends that decided to do this. So there's 12 of us plus the uh, tour guide, 13. And we're driving all around the city of uh, Naples. And we, the first thing they do is in the parking lot of where this, this business is, they get you to kind of get your feet wet uh, and feel good about the segue before you leave. I get on there, two minutes, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling great just due to my athletic nature. And um, wow, can I just tell you this? The first two services didn't laugh. They're like, yeah, we believe you. You sinners are uh, something else. All right, so anyway, I won't forget that. All right, so anyway, <laughs> so Here's what happens. My 11-year-old daughter, my son does great. My 11-year-old daughter, Olivia, takes to the Segway like a fish to water. 
and she's, I mean, she's doing tricks, spinning, leaning. It's incredible. And, and I'm like, do we even know you? And uh, she's amazing at it. And, and but her and I were just killing it on the Segway uh, because remember, there's 13 of us all together. Her and I were at the front flanking the tour guy. We're, it was like a motorcycle gang, but we were there, you know, with him as the leader. And so now we get to about the halfway point. It's about a, almost two, like an hour and a half long tour. We get to about the halfway point and we stop at the Naples Pier, kind of pretty far south in Naples, but at the Naples Pier. And then, you know, they stop there. So anybody needs to use the restroom or get something to drink. And I'm sweating like crazy. Now, I picked, um, because now, I, I, you know, it, it's been nice and cool out, as you know. Um, so, but I picked, our tour was from 11 to 1 you know, nice part of the day. Listen, that's where the BOGO offer was happening. So it's like, hey, sweat it out, people. I ain't paying more than necessary. So we did the BOGO from 11 to 1. And uh, now here's what you got to understand about me is that, you know how some people are, are like, man, it takes a lot for me to sweat. Like someone said that to me recently. Like it takes nothing for me to sweat. If I think hard enough about sweating, I will start sweating. All right. So I am sweating like crazy. And, and the, the heat index, like, you know, the real feel was 122 degrees while we were out. And so my wife, as we stop, so we're kind of on the beach and uh, at the pier. And she says, Bob, you've got like some yellow spots on your shirt. Because what was happening is that I was sweating and whatever chemical they used for the helmet <laughs> plus my sweat had turned into like a yellowish type sauce that was now leaking out of my body and onto this white shirt that I was wearing. And it is now all over me. And so now we're going to do this for another 45 minutes. And then um, we get done and the kids say, this is the funnest thing we have ever done. We have to do this again. And I'm like, well, we'll see next. If the BOGO offer is still going, then do you have a chance? And so then, so we're going to go to lunch and there's this uh, burger place that I've wanted to take the kids that uh, we found at the couple's retreat last year. So we are going to take them to this burger place. And so we're driving there. And, uh, but my wife says, Bob, there is no way that you can go into a restaurant with the shirt, with these like little yellow stains that you have uh, with the yellow stains you have. And I'm looking and I'm like, I guess I see a little something there. I'm like, that's fine. So I'm like, but I'm not driving all the way back to the hotel. So on the way to the restaurant, to this burger place, there's a Target. So I stop at Target. I get out of the car and I'm like, here, just, th it's packed. So I'm like, just drive around until I'm just going to go in and get a shirt and come out. So I go in to Target and I haven't been inside a Target in quite some time, you know, because they're weirdos. And uh, so um, I, oh, glad you like that. Appreciate it. <laughs> I won't go into Walmart either, but that's for other reasons. <laughs> just, I'm not sure I'll make it out alive. Um, so anyway, <laughs> but anyway, so I walk into Target and, uh, you know, I don't know why, like the men's section is all the way in the back. Like right before you get to the dumpsters is where the men's section is. And so I'm walking by and I'm passing the women's section and they have a mirror at the end, at like this end cap. And so I walk by and I look, I don't even recognize the person that I see. And then I look again. I didn't recognize him because the guy in the mirror was wearing a yellow shirt. And I look, my shirt from about here up was covered in that yellow sauce that I was telling you about. It wasn't just, I thought it was droplets. No, it was like a ring. This is now a two-tone shirt. And because uh, I, I would look down at the bottom of the shirt and it looked, anyway, I am so mortified by how nasty this is. I run to wear the shirt. And now I'm like, I'm in a pan. I got to get this shirt off of me. And now it's starting to itch. You know, I'm doing all this crazy stuff with your brain. And, uh, and I'm like, oh God, it's just, it's just, and I'm so, and now it's sticking to me and it's itching. Anyway, I was fine 45 seconds before. But now that I saw it, I'm freaking out. And so anyway, I find a shirt. I'm walking back. I open it up. I realize it's long sleeve. Who sells a long sleeve shirt in the first week of August? I put it back. I finally find another white shirt. I grab it. I walk up to the, the self-checkout area because, you know, apparently now we all work at Target. Um, you know, so I'm waiting for my W-2. And uh, so anyway, I scan the shirt. It's eight bucks. I pay with my watch. And then I, and I, the second I paid for it and got my... 
I, first of all, I don't know what got into me. All right, I'll just say that right now, but I was freaking out. And so the second I paid for it and the receipt came out, I took the shirt off <laughs> right in the middle of Target. And then I had the new shirt and I pulled the little tag that says, you know, the sizing, and I didn't know what to do with it, so I just stuck it on my bare chest. And, uh, and now, I'm, and I'm like, I gotta get out of here. So I'm walking out, I've got my mustard shirt in one hand, I've got the new shirt in the other hand, and I'm trying to pull the tag off, and apparently, the, you need the jaws of life to get this thing off because it won't come out. So I'm walking out, and by the way, I don't even realize this as, I'm, as it's happening, but I'm walking out, I have no shirt on. And people are walking in like, what's up with this guy with the XL stick? Like, we know you're XL, dude. And, uh, and so it's like, don't judge me, man. All shapes are beautiful. And uh, so anyway, so I walk out. Now I walk out into the street. And I still have not put the shirt on. And uh, then I hear in the distance, I hear screaming. My two daughters have rolled down the window because there is a little stop and they're about to, my wife is about to pull up. My wife is driving, just shocked at what she's seeing. My, my son is dying laughing. The kid can't even breathe. He's laughing so hard. My daughters are like, put your clothes on. Put the shirt on. And, and now I hear them and now I'm not going to leave it alone. And I'm like, What? I can't hear you. What are you saying? And they're, now they pull up and they're like, put your shirt on. And I'm like, what? And so anyway, now I'm like, right. And I go to go in and, and, and they're like, no, you're not getting in this car until you put your shirt on. And I'm like, fine. And, and then I, I, I get in the car and they say, dad, that was disgusting. <laughs> I'm like, how dare you? Why? Because I'm not a stereotypical fit bod. I'm almost 50 years old. I have a dad bod and I'm proud of it. By the way, thank you. I identify as a fit bod. <laughs> Welcome to 2023. Now, now, I don't know if this has anything to do with anything. I just got to share some stuff with you about what's going on in my life. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, there's what happens right here. Here, here's what the, the whole thing says. It's just, and my kids were like, this is not what we expected. You went in fully clothed. You came out just partially clothed. You know, it's like, my, I want my dad to be wearing a shirt when he leaves the store. And, and this is the thing that happens is that all of us have expectations about life in a million different ways. And when our expectations are met, the way we think they're supposed to be met, that's what we define as normal life. The problem is what happens when expectations aren't met the way we wish that they were met and when we don't get our expectations, it forces us to change. I was having this conversation with my son the other day because um, we were gonna order from somewhere and they didn't have the thing that he normally gets. My son is like me and that is I go to a restaurant for one thing. Like I already worked out when the restaurant and I were in our dating relationship we worked out what I liked. I liked this one thing from there. And if they don't have that one thing, I'm out. And I'm not saying it's over. I'm just saying, I'll come back when you guys fix this problem and bring back the thing I like. And so anyway, um, and I was telling him, and he's like, what do you do? And I'm like, yeah, listen, it's a tough situation. And um, the first, I remember the first time I went to Cheesecake Factory and they didn't have the factory meatloaf. That was a crisis. And, uh, and, and I was just like, honey, we're out. She's like, we're not out. We waited to sit here. And I'm like, but they don't have the thing I get. She's like, get something else. I'm like, that sounds so easy. Now I got to peruse a 96-page menu to find some other lesser item. I can't do that. I'm like, I can't do that under pressure. And, uh, and because my wife and my, my girls are like this. Oh, they, they are like, they go to a restaurant every time it's a new adventure. A whole new world. I mean, it's like, no, it's not a whole new world. If I get a burger at your place, I will get a burger at your place until the end of time. But I will not deviate, ever. Anyway, and so, and, that, and I was telling them the story of what happened. But you know, that's how the Cajun Chicken Littles came into my life. And now the, and now the meatloaf is dead to me. So, 
things happen. And, uh, but okay, but what about, and I know that's silly, but what about on a serious note, what happens when we have expectations of God, expectations of how we expect God to work, that we want God to work in a certain way on a certain timetable, fulfilling the purpose that we have laid out. Listen, and when he doesn't, we got a problem. By the way, God doesn't have the problem because God loves you, but he ain't taking orders from you. But, and, and this is the thing that's so huge. And the reason why I tell you all of this is because what we're about to embark on in the book of Acts, this week and next week in particular, um, the, this sermon that we're going to look at is so powerful. Now, this is the 11th message in our series in Acts. And if you aren't aware, or maybe you're, you know, someone just invited you and you're like, you're talking, what does Acts mean? Is that an Acts, like an Acts? No, uh, A-C-T, the Acts of the Apostles. Um, the book of Acts is the story of how the, the church grew and developed after the resurrection of Jesus. And so it describes the growth and expansion of the church. And, and we've seen that through the first six chapters that we've read. We've seen the church grow, deal with problems, create some structure to expand ministry. And in the process, we've met a young man whose name is Stephen, a guy who was brought, brought on to serve tables and deal with a feeding program that the church had. But then he had, uh, there was some people in a local synagogue that were accusing him of some things which is what's going to lead into what we see next. But just to kind of, for the sake of backstory, let me just read these last couple verses with you. It says, and so they produced, that is the synagogue, they produced false witnesses who testified, this fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. Now, these are the accusations, and Stephen is then brought before the Jewish council, which is called the Sanhedrin, which is essentially the Jewish Supreme Court, and Stephen is given the opportunity to speak, and what Stephen delivers is the longest sermon in the book of Acts. It's so long, it's going to take us two Sundays to really deal with all of it from top to bottom, so this is going to be part one, but not only is Stephen going to answer the accusations, that's just the first part. The other thing that Stephen is going to do in the process is give us the unexpected way that God has been working throughout history, not so much meeting their expectations because God had been working the whole time. They just didn't even recognize it. So that's where we're going to start in Acts chapter 7 and verse 1. We read this. Then the high priest said, are these things so? And he said, brethren and fathers, listen, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran and said to him, get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land I will show you. And then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. And God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on. But even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give, him, give it to him for a possession and to his descendants after him. But God spoke in this way that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land and that he would bring them into bondage and uh, they would bring them into bondage and oppress them for 400 years. And the nation to whom they will be in bondage, I will judge, says God, and that they shall come out and serve me in this place. Then he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac begot Jacob and Jacob begot the 12 patriarchs. And if you pause there and give me your attention. There's three things that I want to look at in the first part of Stephen's sermon. And the first is this, if you're a note taker, that God is never limited. God's work is never limited to a place. This is a theme that's going to run throughout Stephen's sermon that I will do my best to keep drawing it out as we go through it. And that is God's work has never been limited to a location. Remember, the accusation against Stephen is that he is preaching that Jesus is going to destroy their holy place, the temple, and change Jewish customs. So Stephen's sermon is going to have this undercurrent throughout of it that God has been working outside of Israel. God has been working outside of the temple for his purposes to work. And so he begins with Abraham, the father of the Jewish people, and that God didn't call him when he was in the land of Canaan. Instead, God called him back when he was in Mesopotamia. In fact, if you see on the map, now this whole area, as many of you know, is called the Fertile Crescent. And in this area, very close to the Persian Gulf, 
is a city called Ur, which is right on the uh, Euphrates River. This is where Abraham was from when God called him to leave his country and go to the place that God would show him. What we read is that they travel, and they, you don't travel across the Arabian desert, not if you want to live. Instead, you travel across this kind of rich, lush area along the Euphrates, and you get to this area called Haran. And that's where he dwells for about 25 years until his father dies. After his father dies, he comes down and goes to the land of Canaan, which we now know today as Israel. But the reason that he left in the first place was because God had made him a promise. Stephen quotes part of it. I want to quote the full promise, which is found in Genesis 12, that says, says it like this. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, if you want to write this down, this is what is called the Abrahamic blessing. The promise that God gives to Abraham that he will not only bless him, but that God will bless his descendants, the Jewish people, into perpetuity. Now, but the call is leave your country, leave your family, and go to a place where I'm going to show you. As I said, Abraham doesn't exactly do that at first. He leaves his country, but takes his dad with him. And he takes his nephew Lot with him. When his father uh, eventually dies uh, in Haran, he then goes south to the land of promise. He makes it to the promised land. And as Stephen says, he doesn't get any of it as an inheritance. The only place that Abraham owns in the promised land is found in chapter 23, of the book of Genesis is when he buys a grave for uh, his wife when she, when she dies. But God gives then, according as Stephen says, the, he gives Abraham the covenant of circumcision, that's in Genesis 17, and then fulfills his promise by giving them uh, a son named Isaac. Isaac is born, he's circumcised on the eighth day. Isaac later on has a son named Jacob. Jacob then has 12 sons who become the 12 patriarchs, the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, here's the question I want us to think about, and this is really important. Why is Stephen reciting Israel history, which they already knew, and none of which is in dispute? And the second question is, if you're going to bring up Israel's history, of all the things to bring up, why bring up circumcision? That kind of seems like to show up out of nowhere. But see, it's not out of nowhere. Stephen is building a case. He, he brings it up. Because what he's trying, he wants everybody to get to, to agree, is that God called Abraham, right? He gave him the promise. And then through circumcision, they enter the covenant that God made with Abraham. Okay, that sounds good. And that happened with Isaac? Yes. That happened with Jacob? Yes. That happened with the 12 patriarchs? Yes. Okay, so we're all in agreement that these, that these patriarchs were God's people, right? Yes. And if they're God's people, that means they're always on God's side, right? Right. Wrong. Because just because they were God's people, they had no idea what God was doing. And that's what we're going to see next. Look what happens in verse 9. It says, And the patriarchs, being envious, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of all his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now a famine... And great trouble came over the land of Egypt and Canaan, and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And the second time, Joseph was made known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all his relatives to him, 75 people. And so Jacob went down to Egypt, and he died. He and our fathers and then they carried him back to Shechem and laid him in the tomb that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. Now, if you pause there and give me your attention, listen, he's making the point, and this is the key that, that the, first, the first big point that Stephen is making is, remember the patriarchs, right? The patriarchs, these are, there are few people in Jewish history who are more revered than these 12 individuals, the patriarchs, because these 12 in the individuals become the progenitors of the 12 tribes of Israel. And so what Stephen is getting at in his message is, just because you're a child of, of God doesn't mean that you see what God is doing. 
And sometimes your actions are completely contrary to the work that God wants to do. That's why with Joseph, it's like Joseph had a dream that he was going to be the deliverer of the people, uh, 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 the deliverer of his family. And the way that his brothers repaid him for that dream, they threw him in a pit. They sold him uh, to event to these uh, travelers who eventually sold them to the Egyptians. And they're like, hey, let's see what happens with your dreams now. They were totally on the other side of God's plan. Because just because you think you're right, it doesn't mean that you are. About a million years ago, I was in a band. I had signed a two-album record deal, and our first album came out, and we spent the summer to, uh, on, in support of that album on tour. So we had a show scheduled in Myrtle Beach, uh, South Carolina, and the promoters of the show got... Uh, all the guys in our band, this bungalow, it's like a five bedroom bungalow that we were staying in uh, for the night, full kitchen, washer dryer. Anyway, one of the nicer places we stayed at it was right on the beach. And so now I'm 21 years old and we've been, if, if you're in a band on tour and you're 21 years old, you're only eating fast food, uh, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And so we stayed at this place and somebody had the idea, they're like, look, we have a kitchen. Let, let's walk down to the supermarket. Let's buy real food. And then we can cook it here. I'm like, hey, that sounds good. Well, when you're 20, 21 years old and you say real food, what that means is you're going to the grocery store and buying five frozen pizzas. And so we buy the frozen pizzas, we bring them back, we cook them in the oven and we have lunch. And then we take, and they made this thing like, please just leave this place as nice as you found it. And you know, there's all these stories people tell about bands going crazy. We were Christians, but uh, anyway. So we put the dishes in the dishwasher and then we had to go to sound check. And the way it kind of works when you're in a band is that you kind of drop off your gear and then everything gets set up. You spend, you know, you go to your hotel or wherever you're staying and, um, and then you stay there until sound check, which is like three or four in the afternoon. You get, uh, you drive over, you do sound check, three, four songs, then you drive back um, until it's closer time for the show. Anyway, so... I'm, I'm like, I'm going to deal with all these dishes. So I'm going to put the dishes in the dishwasher before we go to sound check. Now, um, I got to tell you this, and this is an important part of the story. I was 21 years old and I had never used a dishwasher before. And um, you got to understand my, my parents are Cuban and Cubans don't believe in dishwashers. And if you have like your Cuban parents or grandparents, they're old school. They don't believe, that's a waste. I remember my dad, when he came to my house for the first time, that my first house that had a dishwasher, he's like, what is this? This is a total waste of space. And I'm like, as if you've ever done a dish in your entire life. And he was like, fair point. And uh, so anyway, so, and I didn't want to say anything because I knew they were going to give me a hard time for not having ever used a dishwasher. So I'm like, look, how hard could this possibly be? So I open it up and I see that there's like a little receptacle that has the flap. And I'm like, okay, that must be where the soap goes. I look under the sink and I find some palm olive. And I just put the plenty in there. I close the little flap. I hit start, close the door, and I just walk out to go to sound check. I come back two hours later after our sound check, and there is six inches of bubbles on this entire kitchen floor. Um, and I, I mean, I, and these guys start yelling at me. And they're like, you're an idiot. You've never used a dishwasher. Anyway, they really, and then I shared a verse about the persecution of the righteous. And then, um, so they're like, we're not, you're cleaning this. And I'm like, that's fine, I'll clean it. And so anyway, the, 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 the bungalow, it had a side door from the kitchen off to this little porch. So I take a broom and I prop open the door. I literally sweep all of the bubbles out of this house I can't even imagine what the neighbors were thinking. It's like, what's going on in that house? It's like this wall of bubbles leaving the house. And, uh, and, and so anyway, and it was fine. And it, I mean, it looked pretty good. Um, the thing I didn't do, and I didn't realize this was an important thing, was to also mop. Because one of the guys after, I was very careful not to walk on it, but one of the guys didn't know. He walked across and fell flat on his back. Uh, and I told him that was the judgment of God for mouthing off to me. <laughs> and, um, and so anyway... <laughs> Now, sometimes the th you think the thing that you're doing is the right thing, and it can be totally contrary to the plan of God. And this is the thing that I've been saying. The 11 brothers of, of Joseph hated him, and they were wrong. And sometimes you can think you're right and be completely wrong. And, and listen, because it is possible that God is working and we completely miss it. I have a friend who was a missionary in Liberia for years, uh, he planted 
something like 17, 18 churches in, in the country and really started changing the spiritual landscape of that entire country. And as you can imagine, when you, this kind of move starts happening in a country, especially in Africa, um, there are people who are not going to be happy about it. So there was a group of men that decided, hey, we know how to stop this. We're going to kill this guy and his whole team. And it's like, well, that's one way to deal with it. And uh, so my friend hears, and by the way, he has shared this story like on the 700 Club. He shared, you know, uh, some Christian programming. He's shared the story before, and it's a great story. But he hears about it. And uh, the people in the village are like, look, here's what you need to do. You need to get in these canoes that we have, and you need to just get out to the next town over until this kind of blows over. And um, so they get about halfway, and it starts raining. And he says to me, he's like, Bob, it is raining like it has never rained ever in the history of the world. It was raining so hard that we were rowing and going nowhere in this canoe. We couldn't see. We were fighting. We couldn't even tell if we were still going in the same direction. At some times, it felt like we were, we were um, going back to where we had gone before. And so after a couple of hours, they're praying, saying, God, please, you got to make it stop raining. We just, we got to get to this other, this other place. And um, fine, it's still nothing, still raining. And, and, and he, he tells me, he goes, and I prayed this prayer. I'm like, God, if you love me at all, please make it stop raining. And it doesn't stop raining. Finally, that morning, it stops raining. He gets to safety. And then he finds out that the guys who were going to kill them were waiting for it to stop raining so they could get in their boats and find these guys. And listen, and, here, and here's the point. Sometimes we're questioning if God loves us. And, and like, God, if you love me at all, it's like, hey, my love's what's keeping you alive right now. And, uh, and, and, and we don't see it sometimes because we lack the maturity to see it. Listen, God is at work even when we don't recognize it. Faith is what stands in the gap between what is and what we believe should be. Let me tell you what faith is not. Faith is not a feeling. Faith is not having faith in faith. That doesn't even make sense. Um, faith is ultimately trust. Faith is believing, is trusting that God is telling the truth when he gives us a promise. And that Faith is acting on that promise like God is telling the truth. And if you and I will live with that kind of trust, we will see God do amazing things. And if we don't, we will be like the brothers of Joseph where God was at work and we didn't even see it. And now Stephen is going to press this further when he brings um, to an even greater example. Look at verse 17. He says this, but when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt till another king arose who did not know Joseph. This man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so that they might not live. At this time, Moses was born and was well-pleasing to God, and he was brought up in his father's house for three months. But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Now, when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart that he might visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that, the, that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver him by his hand but they did not understand. And the next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting. He tried to reconcile them saying, men, you are brothers. Why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away saying, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed that Egyptian yesterday? Then at that saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian where he had two sons. If you pause there and give me your attention. The second thing I want to tell you that's so important for us is that if God's work is not limited to a place, then the second thing is that God's plan is never limited to a circumstance. What's the point that Stephen is making by bringing up Moses? It's that the children of Israel could not see that Moses was called to be their deliverer. The same way they couldn't see that Joseph was the one who was going to deliver them later, they couldn't see that Moses was. And by the way, just an important side note, Joseph was rejected by his brothers, but was accepted by Gentiles. 
Moses was rejected by his fellow Jews, but was accepted uh, by Gentiles when he spent 40 years in the backside of the desert. Jesus was rejected by the Jewish people, but accepted primarily by Gentiles. Now, there's something important here that I want to talk about for a minute when it says in verse 25, Moses killing the Egyptian. It says that Moses knew, he assumed that the people of Israel would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand. Isn't that an interesting thing? Moses was perfectly equipped for the job. He had the right schooling. He had the right training. He knew all the right people as the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter. And, and I want you to realize something, that when you think about Moses at age 40, don't think of him like the movies where he's dressed like a shepherd with a robe and a long beard and a staff. That is not what Moses looked like. Moses would have looked like an Egyptian. He would have been clean shaven, wearing the Egyptian headdress. He would have been uh, wearing Egyptian clothing. He would have been speaking like an Egyptian. And if the song is true, he would have been walking like an Egyptian as well. <laughs> and, now, but while Moses had the call of God on his life, and felt the call of God on his life. He lacked the maturity to do what God was calling him to do in the time in which he was called to do it. Moses simply wasn't ready yet. And that's okay, by the way. Preparation is important. I believe this is one of the challenges that we have as Christians is dealing with failure. We think that when we fail, God just wasn't in it, right? And we were doing the wrong thing. I, I disagree I think our problem as Christians is that we give up too easily if things don't go perfectly the first time around. Endurance is a quality that we're missing in the church because someone sold us a bill of goods that if God is in it, it's supposed to be easy. I'm sorry, but I think a good argument could be made for the opposite, that if you're going to do something that's important and worthwhile, you should probably assume that there's going to be some opposition. I've been thinking about this passage for the last couple of weeks, and it's just kind of over and over. I've had this on my mind. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 36, it says this, you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Listen, we want the promise without the endurance, and it doesn't work that way. Endurance is the quality that we develop to become the people who can handle the promise when it's finally delivered to us. But the thing about perseverance and endurance is that sometimes we're on to the right thing. We're just doing it in an ineffective way. Maybe we could put it a different way, that sometimes we have the right vision, but the wrong strategy to accomplish it. When I was in college getting my undergrad, uh, one of the things that I did that I was asked to do is that we had this uh, Tuesday night was kind of the big night, like the whole student body would gather. And um, I think I've told you a story. The first time I ever spoke publicly was at one of these devotional nights uh, before class. But um, I used to lead a, what was called the Koinonia group, this fellowship group that was just prayer and worship. And so I would bring my acoustic guitar and I would play some songs and then we'd have prayer uh, for about 30 minutes before, uh, before class started. And so anyway, a local pastor called the dean and said that he's looking for a worship leader. And so that's why I got called in and he, the, the dean um, says, hey, a local pastor needs a worship leader and I recommend a Jew. So here's his telephone number, give him a call um, and he's, he'll interview you and kind of walk you through what the, what the job is. So uh, I call the pastor and um, he does like an interview with me and then he offers me the job. And I say, well, hi, hey, pastor, I really appreciate that. I, I just need to pray about it. And um, God didn't speak to me audibly, but he may as well have because it, I was so convinced that this was something I was not supposed to do. And, that, and he just really, God just made it clear that I was supposed to finish my education. My calling was to be a senior pastor and a Bible teacher. And, 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 but then I had this other thought. And so there was this one part of me that was relieved. I have clear direction. But then there was this other part that I thought, what if this is my only opportunity to serve in ministry? What if this is it? What if I'm saying no to this opportunity and it never comes again? I was 22 years old and I was so nervous because I felt like if I said no to this, I wasn't going to have any future in, in ministry. I was 27 years ago. By the way, that means I'm 49. Just for those of you that are like, hold on, 22, carry the one. 49. But I'm getting close. I'm more like 49.95 because I'm, I'm pretty close. So anyway, um, so... Probably about two years ago, 
I pull out of the development in my house, and I get to Miramar Parkway, and, and I have to make a left to go to church. And I don't know why I had never thought about this. But I'm there, and I made a left, and I realized that the job that this pastor had offered me was on the same street. It's just, it's just all the way out east. You know how Miramar Parkway eventually becomes Hollandale Beach Boulevard as you get a little closer. That's where the church was. And I realized that this was, this was the choice that I was being given all those years ago was do I, do I make the right and go there or do I wait for something better when I go left? And, um, and man, I had like a moment, of, moment with God at that intersection when I, was, when I was coming to church that day. That church is no longer in existence today. And listen, Calvary is thriving. And, and, and listen, and I remember I was so nervous. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I was so nervous about that because I would have been on the right street, but I would have been a world away from what God had called me to do. And, and, and listen, sometimes we have the right vision, but we have the wrong strategy. And sometimes when things don't work out, we just pack it in. It's like, no, 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 you're on, you're on to it. This is the right thing. You just gotta, you gotta figure some things out, but don't give up. Sometimes giving up is the easy way to, to get out of it. Moses had the right calling. He was just too early. He wasn't ready yet. And he found himself on the backside of the desert a million miles away from his calling, thinking, I have messed this up and there is no way that God could ever use me. Well, I'm glad the story doesn't end there. Look what happens in verse 30. This is where we're going to close it. It says, And when 40 years had passed, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. And when Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight. And as he drew near to observe the voice of the Lord came to him saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not look. Then the Lord said to him, take your sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses whom they rejected, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge, is the one God sent to be ruler and deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt, in the Red Sea, and in the wilderness 40 years. And if you pause there, last thing before we close it up, and that is that God's agenda is never limited to a formula. Moses' life should encourage us. Because he spent the first 40 years of his life thinking he was something. Then he spent the second 40 years of his life on the backside of the desert thinking he was nothing. And he spent the last 40 years of his life watching God do something out of nothing. And I want to draw your attention to verse 34 because I think there's some application to what Stephen's hearers were experiencing. Remember, Ro uh, Israel was under Roman occupation. They hated it. They were looking for a Messiah who was a military leader who would free them from the Roman yoke. So Stephen quotes from Exodus 3 in the calling of Moses to be the deliverer and the instrument that God would use to bring freedom to the people. And he mentions the burning bush and that in the middle of the desert, God says, take off your sandals. This is holy ground. Remember the accusation was you want to burn, you want to take our holy place. And God has been, and this is the thing Stephen's been saying, God's been working throughout the world, not just here. Every, and his point is everywhere God is, is holy. That's the point. And that's why, by the way, in verse uh, 36, he says, and God did this in the land of Egypt, and God did this in the Red Sea, and God did this in the wilderness. All of these miracles that God was doing because everywhere God is, is holy. But Stephen quotes this passage that God sees what's happening, he hears the cries of his people, and that he's come to help. I want you to remember that the Jewish people would pray daily for the Messiah to come. And they were missing it. Just like they missed it when Joseph came, it wasn't until the second time they saw Joseph that they recognized him. It wasn't until the second time that Moses showed up that they uh, recognized him as the deliverer and they missed Jesus the first time and he's like, you can't miss the second. Listen, sometimes we just don't know what time it is. Um, my niece, Sarah, is uh, like our fourth child. Uh, we're, we've always been super close with her and we've been like, her and I have been like peas and carrots since she was born. And when she was about five, she, uh, I said to her, I said, Sarah, 
when do you have lunch with, uh, at school? And uh, maybe I'll bring you McDonald's one day and we'll have lunch together. She's like, oh, Uncle Bob, that would be great. I have lunch at noon. I said, oh, great. So that week I was in the area for a meeting and I swung by McDonald's, picked up two meals and I got to her school and I used to be an assistant pastor at the, at the church where the school is. So I found out where Sarah's class was and, and went to have lunch with her and then realized that she has lunch at 11 a.m. So uh, because I knew the teacher, anyway, they, they let me take her out of class for a few minutes and, we, and her and I talk and I'm like, Sarah, why did you say that you have lunch at noon when you actually have lunch at 11. She's like, Uncle Bob, I'm so sorry about that. I think the problem is that I'm five and I don't know how to tell time. <laughs> you can't argue with that. And so anyway, we hung out for a little bit. It wasn't a total loss. I ate both McDonald's meals. And uh, so it's good. <laughs> but listen, this is a problem that all of us have is that we're struggling to tell time to see what God is doing and when we don't see the result and what time, whatever we think it is, like the time is now for him to do something and and we think that God isn't working. No, God is working. Sometimes good things just take a little longer. My wife is the best chef that I've ever known, ever. Um, It's one of the thousand reasons I love her. When, When I met my wife, I weighed 180 pounds and now I do not. And uh, in fact, but no, five years ago, I weighed 280 pounds. And I'm not saying that my wife's cooking made me fat, but her cooking was not encouraging me to be skinny. That's for sure. But you know, when you have that level of knowledge uh, about cooking and food, it, it, it creates problems because whenever my wife and I go to a restaurant, like I, or, like I said, I order the same thing. And my life usually involves a protein and a salad because I can't have any joy. And my wife scans the menu. And she's like, oh, I like this dish. Mm-hmm. But if I take the side from this other dish and put it with the protein from this dish, and then I take the sauce that they had in one of these appetizers, and I put that. It's like the five lions coming together and forming Voltron. That's basically what she's, she's doing. And then when it comes out, it is literally the greatest thing ever. And people are like putting it on the menu later. This is why a friend of mine says, Carrie is the only person who still cooks when she goes to a restaurant. And, um, but you know, I will say this, and this is true. It always takes a little longer to get there because it's a special order. And here's my point. If you're in a season of waiting, could it be that God is working a special order for you like he did for the Jewish people? You see, I love this passage in Isaiah chapter 41 that says, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. You see, maybe the season of waiting is strengthening you for the next season to handle the fulfillment of the promise that God has. Listen, Stephen's been preaching to these Jewish leaders but he's also preaching to us. He's encouraging us to see God moving and working and setting things up. And even if we don't see it, because he's been working behind the scenes for us to trust that it's happening. As I said, the Jewish leaders kept missing it. Their forefathers missed it. They didn't recognize Joseph until the second time. They didn't recognize Moses until the second time. But what if we recognized that God was at work the first time? What if we waited on him the first time instead of making a decision that we later ended up regretting? You know what would happen? Your faith would soar. You'd grow like you never thought possible. You'd have more joy than you think should be legally allowed for a person to have. And it was all because you trusted that God was working and moving on your behalf. And in the end, God fulfilled his promise to you. Let's pray together. And Lord, we want to thank you for that. And we look forward to you fulfilling your promise in us. Build our faith, build our trust in you. And we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us today. If you made a decision to follow Jesus and begin a relationship with him, congratulations. It's the best decision you're ever going to make. You may be wondering, so what happens now? Where do I go from here? Just text BEGIN to 62488 and we'll be able to send you this free gift. It's a book called Begin, written by Pastor Bob, and it's going to help you take those first steps on your new journey of faith. So remember, to stay up to date with everything happening at Calvary, follow at MyCalvary on Instagram and Facebook. Until next week, we love you, we're praying for you, God bless you.